Hello and welcome to the Lebanese Politics Podcast. My name is Benjamin Red, joined as always by Nizar Hassan. Uh, happy Easter, happy second Easter, Nizar. Thanks to you too. Thank you, thank you. We've we've had some really uh, crazy weather this winter, and it turns out that this winter has been the wettest in like 16 years since 2002 to 2003. We got over a thousand millimeters of rain this winter compared to like 540 last winter. So like almost double the amount of rain. Yeah, it's insane. And we're in spring now. It's supposed to be fine weather. Why was it snowing last week? Why did I wake up in my village house and it was all white outside? It was literally zero degrees. It's just insane. Doesn't make sense. Uh, so this week, our main topic is the budget. We we had this entirely different show planned for you guys this week, talking about like austerity and all of this stuff. And, and then the budget dropped, like literally... We were going to press record yesterday on Saturday, and then like an hour before we press record, the budget leaked. And so we changed everything. We ripped everything up and we created a new show. We're looking into the budget. And is it, on, is, is it the budget of austerity that we were promised or no? Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to take you through that. Uh, but first to the news. This past week, there was just a lot of stuff about Hezbollah. So on Monday, Nasrallah came out and had a speech. And, and in this speech, he uh, denied this report that had come out in a Rai newspaper, a Kuwaiti newspaper. The, the, this report had said that Nasrallah had warned his commanders that Israel is planning a surprise attack on Lebanon this summer. Uh, and Nasrallah came out and said, nope, that's not it. I personally don't believe that's the case. This is just, uh, you know, needless media, you know, speculation. Mm-hmm. Not true. Uh, also Monday, the United States uh, State Department announced the something called the Rewards for Justice program that would be targeting Hezbollah's financial network or whatever. And they offered up to $10 million for info on Hezbollah's financial network and highlighted three specific individuals that they thought or were like very much connected to this. Um, and they, these are three individuals who have been sanctioned before and everything. They're just saying, if you know more information about these people, we'll give you money for it. This is the same program that's used. Like, it's not a new program. It's the same program that's used for like getting information on Al-Qaeda, on Daesh, Osama bin Laden's son, for instance. They're offering cash for information about him. Mm. And and this is not the first time that they've used it against Hezbollah either. But it, it, it was, you know, like yet another sort of ratcheting up from the U.S. side, uh, especially targeting Hezbollah's finances. And then on Wednesday, so two days later, they actually did sanction two people that were connected to two of the people that they had highlighted, uh, it, it was this was a Treasury Department action, not a State Department action, but they they sanctioned uh, two people and three companies. It, just yet another, you know, more of these actions. Obviously, the U.S. government is very, very serious about trying to uh, shut down financing for Hezbollah. But obviously, this happened too quickly for the these two things to be connected. Nobody's, you know, Treasury does not designate somebody this quickly. They didn't get information on Tuesday and turn around Wednesday and sanction somebody. That's not how the process works. So, two like seemingly connected events, but they're they're not really. Um also Wednesday we had an issue with Lebanon's defense minister who made some very controversial comments. Yeah, Elias Boussab, who is very close to Hezbollah, he's an FPM minister, but he's considered one of the closest people to Hezbollah and FPM. He made a comment about the fact that a national defense strategy would be kind of useless to discuss as long as Israel is threatening Lebanon. He continued, obviously, and said good things about Hezbollah being the resistance, etc., which was not shocking at all. But the fact that he said that we don't need to talk about the national defense strategy before we are free from the threats of Israel was very concerning to a lot of people, including diplomats and politicians from anti-Hezbollah backgrounds, especially people from the Lebanese forces who were kind of attacking Busab after this. Anyway, he had to clarify his comments, and he said that he couldn't really clarify what he said. Is that He had to walk it back. Yeah, uh, and he said that Aoun, uh, the president Aoun is actually planning to invite political leaders very soon to have a debate, like a dialogue about uh, how they can work out a national defense strategy, which has been a topic that I've been hearing about since my childhood, like since 2006, at least. This has been always a very controversial thing. And it's seen as the way 
the transition from the current situation to a situation where we don't need Hezbollah as a militia to protect Lebanon. Anyway, we'll see what happens with that in the near future. And then on Thursday, we had UNIFIL coming out saying that they found that a third tunnel crosses the blue line. You'll remember back in like December and January, there was this whole thing about Israel saying, oh, we found all of these quote unquote attack tunnels under the border. Well, UNIFIL confirmed that a third one does cross at least, at least cross the crosses the blue line. Israel claims to have found six. Uh, Nasrallah has confirmed the existence of these tunnels in the past, but he didn't say if Hezbollah built them or not. Yeah. And then finally, on Friday, Noef Musawi, MP for Tyre in the South, Hezbollah MP, was sort of re- resumed his duties as, as an MP. Hezbollah had suspended him from his duties after an outburst between him and Nadim Jamail and Sami Jamail in parliament back in February. Now he's back. All right, so that is the week of Hezbollah. Also, we had a big report come out from Amnesty International, and a campaign was launched to end the the kafala system, which we've talked about this before. Uh, You can check out episode 10 of this podcast. The kafala system, uh, as I'm sure everybody's well aware, is the sponsorship system for foreign workers here, uh, especially for foreign domestic workers. That links their status, their immigration status, to their employer personally. Yeah, which causes a lot of bad things to happen, right? Yeah. And so the, the report that came out said, oh, surprise, surprise, this system is really, really bad. They interviewed 32 domestic workers in the study. Six of them reported physical abuse. One reported sexual abuse. Some were called insulting names or otherwise humiliated. Like, for instance, one wasn't allowed to sit on the couch, quote unquote, because I would pass on my bacteria. <gasps> Insane. Nuts. Yeah. Um. A majority were required to work more than the maximum 10 hours per day. Uh, 14 were denied their weekly day off. Um, Some of them reported uh, having salaries withheld or delayed or lowered. A majority had their passports taken away, so freedom of movement's gone. Also, 10 could not leave the house unaccompanied, another freedom of, of movement issue. Some were actually locked in at times. Many were denied proper medical care. Uh, some reported uh, suicide attempts or ideations. And none of them went to the authorities, some of them out of fear of arrest or deportation or or other negative consequences. Um, And none of them knew of this labor ministry hotline supposedly for them that also doesn't work. So it it was really sort of just a damning report. Yeah. Now, uh, the new labor minister, Kamil Abu Suleiman of the Lebanese forces, says the labor ministry has prepared a draft law to protect domestic workers. Um, He's also... It says that he's recommended forming a task force to recommend reforms to the system. But the the campaigners are saying, like, you can't reform, like, the, the system needs to be replaced. It needs to be totally abolished and something new needs to happen. Which has been the demand of most organizations working on this issue, like the anti-racism movement, which is the partner of Amnesty International in this new campaign. And everyone agrees, like, as long as kafala exists in its current form, at least, it's impossible to protect the workers and their rights. So their rights as workers as well as their rights as humans. Also this week, we had sort of a, a very truthful interview from one of our politicians. Maybe not the smartest thing to do, but I, I think it's sort of refreshing. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a big faux pas or an intentionally like provocative statement. But Dima Jamali, uh, an MP that we have spoken about a lot quite recently on this She podcast, just got reelected, yeah. In Tripoli. So she had the TV interview on OTV and she was asked about a lot of things, some of them related to the election, obviously. And the interviewer asked her whether they paid money, whether they bribed voters to vote for her in the elections. And Jamali, shockingly, really, she said something like in the, in the sense of we didn't want to bribe people. We didn't want to use uh, money for elections. We didn't want to do all of these things, but we didn't have a choice. So basically, she acknowledged that this happened quite Honestly, more honestly that you would want to to hear. And then she said something like, I don't know exactly how much money was spent. And I wasn't like she kind of isolated herself from the actual action of bribing or of paying voters to do that. But she said that it was maybe the only way that would work. And also at another point, she said, actually, maybe it would have, it was a good thing because the people of Tripoli are very poor and it's good that they had a chance to make some money during the election. See, I I thought that this was actually kind of refreshing until you get to this final point, or, or <laughs> then she defends it. Like, no, no, like it. 
everybody knows this happens, right? And so it it's kind of cool that a politician came out and said it, even even if it may be kind of like stupid from their, you know, from their own interests to do this. But yeah, like going on to defend it, it's just like, are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I haven't seen anything like that. And uh, LADE, the Lebanese Association for Democratic Elections, which monitors elections and makes sure they are uh, transparent, they released a statement saying this is like basically just a notice to the authorities that they should do something about it. This is this should be a scandal. This should not, not be a normal scandal. I mean, if someone says that I was elected and money played a role in that because people were bribed, they should not be in 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 parliament right they should there should be a, a judicial process that's very straightforward in this sense and i'm sure that right. there are many ways that uh, people can uh, challenge her, her status based on that but i don't think anything will happen because apparently political parties other political parties are not really investing in this moment they're not building on it maybe it's just like a gesture of goodwill towards well everybody Hariri. does the same thing so also yeah they don't want to like expose each other's uh, yeah money elections and then one last thing that also happened this week is that President Aoun signed a decree to release the municipal funds for 2017. So basically we have the independent municipal fund where money comes in from the central government, mostly from the telecom sector, and then they go to fund the municipalities and their activities. Municipalities in Lebanon uh, have this as the primary source of uh, income because their own tax collection is very limited, especially that we have too many municipalities and they're all very small. So they're all mostly poor. And the money has been withheld for so long. For example, I was uh, meeting many mayors recently and they told me in Shouf, they told me that they hadn't received uh, their funds from the central government for eight months. So they were late on salaries. They had to be kind of looking for other sources of income. For example, now all mayors, part of what they do, part of their de facto job description is just trying to get money and donations from international NGOs and projects to collaborations kind of to to make sure that they have something to offer to their constituents. So it's very good that they release the funds and hopefully this, I mean, I hope this will be happening smoother in a smoother way in the future because really the status of municipalities in Lebanon is, is very devastating. And on that note, we go from the local financial situation to the national one. This is our main topic this week. As I said uh, at the top of the show, we had a whole different program planned for you today, and, and then the budget came out, uh, or the, or what we think the budget came out. Something was leaked, and it looks very, it, it, it looks real. It, it looks like this is the this is the real deal, this is a real document. A lot of the things that we had heard from very reputable sources we're in it. We're actually yeah. in this document, and so we we have high confidence that this is actually the document, uh, more or less. Right? There were there were like ten pages missing, which is weird. We'll talk about that more later. <laughs> uh, but but let, let's let's back up for a minute and give a little bit of background. Exactly. So let's explain why we're talking about the budget. Why it's such a big deal, this budget specifically. So basically, we have had kind of a national panic about the need for austerity recently. And it's because, first of all, our debt, our public debt has become completely unsustainable. And there is a very serious risk of default by the Lebanese government not being able to pay back its debt. And uh, we have many reports. We talked about this in several previous episodes. So, for example, check out the episode on the lira or on the budget, and we'll give there more context on, on this situation. But anyway, we have this crisis. And then we went to SAD, to the Paris conference, And we asked international donors to give us money, the government, right? And one condition for this money, especially by the World Bank, which will give around close to 40% of this money, is that Lebanon implements some reforms that they had been insisting on for, for a long time. And the most important reform is fixing the deficit that we have in the budget. Lebanon has had very high deficit in the budget. Last year, it was close to $6 billion. So it's more than 10% of the GDP or... 40% of our revenues. So the need to fix the budget has been very taken very seriously by political actors this time. And that's only going to grow, right? Because the debt is something like $85 billion. And and it just keeps on eating up a larger and larger chunk of state revenues every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and this is going to become unsustainable at some point in the very near future. So so we got to fix this now while we still can is the idea. Exactly. So everyone has been talking about austerity and austerity. Uh, Prime Minister Hariri said we need unprecedented austerity and we will have it in this budget. People from across the spectrum have been talking about this word and kind of promoting this word. 
austerity. So the budget was highly anticipated because it's the first budget of austerity, right? It was not 100% clear what these political leaders meant when they said austerity because some of them were talking about things like cutting public sector wages while others were saying maybe we should increase the VAT tax and others were saying like remove some, fix some corruption in the in the public sector. I mean, clearly they meant there's going to be pain. Get, get ready for something, you know, to, to tighten your belts for the general public. Yeah, exactly. And now what we understand is that the budget introduces austerity from the perspective of limiting the size of the public sector and the money being spent on it in the near future. So this is a very typical kind of what we call neoliberal reform, which is limit the public sector because the public sector is a burden on the state uh, expenditures and is also bad for development and all of these theories that they have. But anyway, this was the aspect of austerity that we can see in the budget. Right. And that, that being said, though, this is not the austerity budget that I was expecting. I was I was very surprised. This is does not include any any sort of humongous drastic cuts. It it's sort of like a very watered down, weakened form of austerity that we're talking about, and 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 you'll see that uh, when we go through the cuts here. So basically, in this project to kind of gradually limit the public sector, we can talk about eleven main reforms that were in the budget, and all of these obviously are unpopular things because they will hurt specific people. Uh, mostly civil servants, and they were all part of the 10 pages that magically disappeared from the budget document. Yeah, in this document, and you can you can go to it online, I know uh, VDL posted it online, it, it just jumps from page, I think, 39 to 49 at one yeah. point, right in the middle of the taxes <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, just after tax- taxes, they have this section called miscellaneous articles or whatever, and this one has all the austerity. So basically, they put all of that there, and they they didn't include it in the text. They, obviously, we cannot be 100% sure that it was intentional, but they magically disappeared. All the unpopular things magically disappeared from the document, but they, they still kept them in the annexes uh, where they explained the reasons for these reforms, for everything mentioned in the budget. So we got access to them there. And basically, they include... Cutting in half the salaries of the president, MPs, and ministers, which is a populist uh, demand, very limited value in terms of how much money we're saving. But yeah, its, it's value is more in just the symbology of it, right? Exactly, symbolic. Second, the budget outlaws um, having two salaries from the public sector simultaneously, being retired and having an active salary, or to act, uh, two salaries being an active worker. It's illegal now. Third, they eliminated the system where civil servants get paid more than 12 months per year. And this is the case in Central Bank and Ogero and SSF, many other institutions. Uh, they listed like seven or eight of them. Fourth, they obliged public institutions to return their excesses and revenues to the treasury directly. They froze retirement requests for people below the age of 64, which is the legal age of retirement in Lebanon, for a period of three years. Or if they insist on retiring earlier, they can uh, give away 25% of their pension in return, like as a cost for this exceptional retirement. Six, they gave a government three months to make a plan to reform the military retirement system. And this is very sensitive because uh, military retirees and people in the army were expecting this to be in the budget. So the budget kind of kicks the ball to the government, to the to the prime minister, basically, for him to be uh, deciding on this so that they don't introduce it now and they cause uproar. Right. But at the same time, this means maybe this just isn't going to happen as well. Yeah, maybe. They also capped the extra salary compensations for civil servants, people who get compensations above their salary, to a certain uh, amount which is equal to the um, uh, total of all salaries in that year, basic salaries. And eighth, they reduced the salaries of the highest paid civil servants so that they all match the president's salary, which is $8,300 almost. Ninth, they cut 3% of the monthly pensions of retired military personnel. They actually did that. And this money is supposed to be to fund their own hospitalization costs and other things that they offer to them. So basically, they take away some of their pension to give it back in terms of services or benefits. But the, these services and benefits already existed, so they're not giving back anything new, but they're saying this is what happens with other civil servants, so we will do it with military pensioners as well. And 10th, they reduced the number of paid leave days from 20 to 15. And most importantly... The 11th one is they froze employment in all the public sector, including contracting for three years, 
uh, with the exception of first degree posts and board members of state institutions. And the plan is they want to replace any retirees in these three years. And after these three years, they will start recruiting only half the number of retirees. So basically, every time two people retire, we only employ one. And in the first three years, we don't employ anyone. So this means maybe in 30 years, we will have almost half the number of civil servants that we currently have. This is how they're cutting the public sector, which is really maybe the most ideological thing in this budget, because it goes along the line of ideologically charged economic reforms that said that say that the public sector being big and offering jobs to a lot of people is a bad thing. At the same time, though, this is not entirely new. The, the, the retirement thing is new, but like the freeze in public sector hiring, that's been ongoing since 2017. Mm-hmm. So so that's these are all sort of like smallish measures, it seems. Uh, but, but yet at the same time, either there was just a mistake or they felt that these measures were still sensitive enough to <laughs> delete 10 pages of the leaked document. <laughs> One of the two, who knows? And, and I think this is sort of borne out, the, the, the fact that these are all sort of like minor measures, it's borne out in the numbers. Right? So if you actually look at the spending numbers in the document itself, it says we are going to spend 23.6 trillion lira, about $16 billion this year. That's compared to 23.9 trillion in last year's fictional-ish budget, uh, so about the same as, as last year's budget. And and the actual budget expenditures, according to the Ministry of Finance, were $22.95 trillion for January through November 2018. So we're looking at, it's going to round out to be about $25 trillion lira for 2018. Okay, so if these numbers hold, if the new $23.6 trillion number is accurate, that'd be a cut of about 1.4 trillion uh, lira, about $1 billion. Not bad, right? Yeah. But they didn't seem to include EDL transfers in the budget again. I, I looked at the line where it should, EDL transfers should be, and it's about the same as it was last year. It's a line called shared expenditures, and it, it, it it's basically the same as it was last year. And last year, if you remember from our, our budget episode, they just totally ignored transfers to EDL, which is like $1.4 billion. And totally wrote it off of the budget, even though they still paid it, mm-hmm. right? And so it seems as though they've done that again this year. Now, we don't know that for sure because this is not like a complete budget. I can't go to the tables and the annex and see this. It, it's not like the 1,000-page document. It's 130 pages or something. Mm-hmm. But it, from from the top-line numbers, it's pretty clear that they didn't include EDL transfers again, even though... Yeah, the electricity plan is going forward, but we're going to still be paying EDL transfers for the rest of this year. So hopefully in the next week, maybe we'll understand whether any reduction in in spending is is achieved. Yeah, there might actually be an increase. Yeah. But I guess most importantly, the things that we were most concerned about uh, that Jibran Basil had promoted and failed miserably because everyone told him this is a red line and you can't do it is cutting public sector wages. This was really on the table. A lot of people were discussing it. And Basile said that we need to do it because otherwise you would leave, you would lose your salaries altogether. But anyway, there has been protests about it. We mentioned this before. So basically they were smart enough not to include this in the budget because we saw protests, protests last year, last week and the week before about this. And we will keep seeing protests about these bad measures that they might be taking. So they saved themselves some real headache, I think, with this one. Yeah, and, and we should note as well that they they did do one other thing, and that is they postponed a lot of capital spending. If if you go into this second section of the law, that's the section all about you know capital spending, uh, you know like the big projects that cost a lot of money and everything, multi year things. And basically, what they would do is they would just zero out the number for two thousand nineteen and like tack that number on to the end was 2022, 2023, add another year, put that, num- put that number there. So uh, for instance, uh, you know, everybody is waiting for like lightning fast fiber optic internet. Well, they did with this, what, and, it, and actually they did the same thing last year with, with this uh, line item on the budget was they cut it in half from like 150 billion lira to 75 billion lira. And then just like added that 75 to next year. And so if any of you are complaining about the rollout of fiber in the country and why internet is still so fucking slow, well, 
the blame doesn't all lie at very least with Ogero. It doesn't all lie with a mad credie. Like <laughs> a lot of it has to do with the fact that the politicians keep slashing the budget for this. Yeah, and and it's a uh, it's a bit funny to read all of these items in the budget saying postponed till 2021, or actually just moving the money from 2019 to 2021, because like I'm just thinking and predicting what will happen in 2021. Will we have a very good financial situation for the state where they can suddenly actually implement these projects, or are just are they just postponing them because they know they're not gonna do them? We can't be very optimistic about that. Right, right, right. But but yeah, so like back to your main point, though, that like, yeah, the, the politicians seem to have also just like postponed angry street protests or anything like that. They didn't. It, it all seems to be smallish window dressing cuts on, on the expenditure side. Nothing really huge, nothing really major. And, and that's borne out in the top line numbers. Exactly. One last thing I want to mention about what we have said so far about the austerity that is in the budget is that this is very politically relevant. This is a very sensitive thing for the political system that we have because political leaders have grown in terms of popularity and have entrenched themselves in as as the only representatives of their areas, particularly through employment and state jobs. And the fact that we froze employment now for the next three years, it's a big blow to one of the main, if not the main, tool used in this clientelist sectarian relationship between the politician and the followers i think this is very important for us as you know people who are involved or support independent political movements to use this and as an opportunity to tell people this has been this is unsustainable what you have been benefiting from is something that could not, cannot go on in the future this so this cannot be the way that you make political decisions for that future Okay, so we've talked about one side of the equation, which is the expenditures. The other thing is revenues, where, you know, in the budget, it also explains where they're going to get the money to spend all of this stuff, and whether it's through taxes or from telecom revenues or whatever, all of that it, it is also there. So, so we do have some measures, again, on this side of the equation, raising certain taxes, doing certain things to raise more revenues uh, to help balance the equation and drive down the deficit. But again, it, do it doesn't seem like a whole lot, right? Yeah, and this is where the austerity that we expected did not happen. We expected some regressive taxation, like an increase in VAT to 15% was discussed widely, also a tax on gasoline. So this, is not, this was not in the budget. Great, actually, because really this would have been a huge burden on, on the poorest families in Lebanon specifically and on middle class in general. And we did have some steps in the right direction. Uh, the personal income and the corporate income tax were both increased, not for everyone, just for the highest earners, up to 25%. So the maximum had been 20% for personal income and 21% for cor corporate income. Now they included a top bracket. One for people earning more than $150,000 a year, be it companies or individuals, and these people have to pay 25%. So this is good. It's progressive. And there was another tax reform that we were kind of excited about, which is they increased the tax on the money made through interest on saving accounts, on deposit accounts. So basically, when you put your money in the bank to save them, you make money out of interest, right? This profit that you make, it is taxed, but it's, it was only taxed at 7%. It used to be taxed at 5% and they increased it in 2017 and now they're increasing it again to 10%. On on that though, there was a lot of talk about there being a, a threshold. So only high, like big bank accounts would have this increase. That didn't happen. There's no threshold there. It's everybody. Exactly. And this is what you touched on now is one of the big problems with this tax reform. So this 10% is not progressive. It applies to everyone. And why is this a big, big issue? Because the distribution of wealth in bank accounts in Lebanon is ridiculously unfair. It's, it's so concentrated. Fascinating. So according to Al-Akhbar's calculations, 52.8% of total deposits in the Lebanese banks are in 0.8% of accounts. So less than 1% of people own more than half the total money that exists in the bank accounts. On the bottom end of the spectrum, the rest of us, 60% own less than 1% of the money. So really insane concentration so instead of imposing a proportional tax that would for example hit people who have more than one million dollar but would not touch people that have less than three thousand because they sold their old honda or whatever no this one is ten percent for everyone so this is one another form of regressive taxation that is also a bit you know 
in my opinion a bit stupid because you didn't need to to if you had a proportion one you would make a bit less money maybe if you unless you increase the rate but at least you would you know protect the savings of the poor middle class families who have bank accounts um, that are their only safety nets in, in light of the absence of a, a real welfare state here. Another big problem is that the income tax reform was also not progressive enough. It's very biased towards the rich. So the brackets stop at 150000 So a startup company, right? A young company making $151,000 a year will pay the same percentage as another company making hundreds of millions of dollars in net profits a year. And it is very biased towards the interests of the bankers. Surprise! Because the banks and all financial companies kept a rate of 17%. So, again, going back to that startup company that makes 151k a year, this company will pay 7% more than the most or one of the most profitable banks in Lebanon, Bank Audi, which makes, wait for it, 4,000 times as much money. Right, right. Bank Audi made 500 million dollars in profit last year. Only rivaled by Blom Bank, which made like five hundred ten million dollars, and and these are like after tax profits. So like really, you know, they they both made pre pre tax profit, you know, uh, like six hundred million dollars. You know, they 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 are making half a billion dollars, and they're being taxed at a lower rate than like the startup that you're talking about with much smaller revenues. And look at the implications of this on the economy. Companies in the productive sectors that are, you know, working to, inc- to create jobs and to create things that we can maybe export and get some money coming in the country are taxed at 25% now, ones that make more than $150,000 a year, which is very little anyway. While companies that make money out of money, right, financial companies, are given the privilege of having a lower tax rate. And a lot of this money that they make, as we've mentioned before on this podcast, is because they lend the state, which are, is, is basically the biggest banks. So this really gives an idea of how the political elite in Lebanon, how biased it is towards towards this sector, specifically the financial sector, possibly because it's very connected to it, of course. Yeah, um, just out of fairness, I will note that if you talk to bankers, they say, no, that's not really true because there's a thing called called double taxation. And it, this is a whole nother can of worms. But basically, they say if you work out all the numbers, then it comes out to banks paying something like 40 percent on, on their income. Just out of fairness, want to throw that out there. Yeah, although, it, 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 to get into that would be a whole nother can of worms, though. Of course, but like we encourage people to look at the statements of Biblos and Blom and Audi and these banks and see how much really net profits are made after tax. So this is for the tax reforms. But one more thing that was maybe the rudest thing about this budget in terms of revenue generation is that it did not include any taxes on the occupiers of coastal properties. All of these projects and individuals who occupy coastal properties on the on Lebanon's coast, on the Mediterranean beach, and they make them into private properties, which is against the basic laws of this country, they are not paying real you know, fees for this. Um, according to Information International, if we tax these, if first of all, if we fix the situation legally, and get money for that, we can make $2 billion one-time payment, one-time revenue, which would be great given the situation. And then we can make $400 million a year. If this is true, this would have been maybe the best way to ensure revenues also in line with our principles, which is that these are public properties and they should not be occupied in the first place. But it's not a surprise that they didn't include that because the major projects on this coast, as everyone in Lebanon knows, are directly related to politicians and their families in Beirut and in the south and in the north everywhere their politicians are directly involved in investing in these properties right and so if we if we take a step back now and look at these reforms and lack of reforms and everything and just look at the numbers then on the revenue side it it's sort of it it's the same thing as what we saw on the expenditure side it's window dressing there there was no like huge oh we're going to you know raise a lot of money from this basically we've got 18.3 trillion lira, about $12 billion in revenues that they expect. And that compares to 18.7 trillion in last year's budget law. And it compares to 15 trillion for January through November 2018, according to the Ministry of Finance, uh, which is so it's going to likely round out for last year to be something like 16.4 trillion for all of 2018. So 18.3, if they do make 18.3, that's, that's good. That's, that's, quite a bit more than 16.4, right? Mm. But 
last year they said that it was going to be 18.7 in the budget loss. So it, is this, is this 18.3? Is that a real number or is it like last year's sort of fictitious number? I don't, I don't know, but it, it's, it's very strange though, that they don't seem to have raised any revenues, like any substantial revenues at all from any of these, uh, these measures. And if you look at the numbers specifically for the tax on profit, actually comparing the, the budgets of 2018 and 2019 in this budget document, you see that the number decreased. So how come are we making, are we going to make less money from taxes on profits after increasing the taxes? Maybe this is a technical error. I hope so. I hope the, the number is actually bigger, but this would affect everything, right? If, if the numbers are or actually... Or maybe the economy is just doing that poorly. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. So so big picture. We've, we've talked about expenditures. We've talked about uh, revenues. Yeah, there and, and there are some measures that they have taken, but it's all sort of small type stuff. It doesn't really affect the top line numbers. So what does that mean going forward? We were discussing this for hours before recording this podcast. What do we expect really to happen? Because this budget is not enough to deal with the situation. Right, so, it's not the austerity budget. That this, this is not a fucking austerity budget. This is not what they were priming us for. Yeah, so we can expect some things to happen in the short term. One of them would be people saying, this is not real austerity, this is not real austerity, we need harsher austerity. And this would take us to maybe regressive revenue generation through increasing VAT or gasoline, etc. I highly suspect that this might happen, actually, because when there's pressure from, especially from the media that is really ridiculous on covering economic issues in Lebanon, we have the worst media in terms of coverage of economic issues. Everyone is like bourgeois minded and have no idea how to be critical of economic policies. It's absolutely ridiculous, like with, a, with a few exceptions, really. This might happen. And also, especially that if the World Bank, for example, makes a statement or leaks a statement or whatever, that this budget is not enough and this will not ensure that Lebanon gets its money, this would be even more possible. Another thing that actually a friend of mine warned me about or pointed out is that they might take some austerity measures through decrees and through memos, internal memos in the institutions and not include them in the budget. For example, release a memo saying cut your expenses by 20% because we don't have enough money for the rest of the year, something like that. Yeah, but when those things have happened in the past, they don't. nobody really respects them, it, it, it seems. Yeah, so we're not sure how also how how the scale would be, how, how major this would be, but this is a possibility, right? Another thing that we would be more in, more positive would be that they take on the banks. Yeah, so there's this very solid rumor going around that the government is going to sort of get together with the banks and give them a deal that they will not be able to refuse, and this deal is to basically swap out eight hundred million dollars of. Uh, lira denominated debt that they that, that the state owes for for another 800 million dollars but at a much lower interest rate at one percent interest uh and and this would be for a period of, of uh, two or three years something like that um and so that would drastically reduce for the next couple of years it would drastically reduce that debt service component of the budget allow the state hopefully to get on a much sounder financial footing but the banks obviously really don't want this. They want to keep making money. They want to keep making, you know, the, you know, 7% or whatever that they're making right now off of these uh, treasury bills. But they they might have to accept this. Uh, and, and, and this does seem like a very credible rumor that this is this is being seriously talked about. And, and, and it may actually uh, come to fruition here. We can see this actually as the price that they are paying for not being included in the tax increases, right? Because this, to me, this sounds, this looks like a deal if the treasury bonds deal happened. Uh, a deal whereby they don't pay more taxes like all companies will do, all big companies. But on the other hand, they will accept this deal. So basically, instead of losing money consistently every year, they swap the treasury bonds, sacrifice some future profits for the next three years, that they had on the books before, but they will not be receiving because the interest rate was uh, reduced. At the same time, on the long term, they're still protecting the rate of, pro of profit that they have. Yeah, and, and there's so much that I want to talk about right now getting into this debt research because there's a lot of a, a lot of details and a whole lot of history as well, but we, we really don't have the time for that. So instead, I just want to like sort of like step back then and and make a more general observation about this is that there are going to be calls to actually do something, right? Because this budget doesn't really do, doesn't affect the numbers in the way that it needs to. 
and they're there's basically one of two ways to do that. Either you make the public pay for it through salary decreases for public servants or VAT increases or gasoline tax, something like that, or you make the rich people pay for it, basically the banks and, and, and those very high net worth individuals. So it's really one of those two. You, you, that's it. The, those are the only two real sources of fixing the budget that we have. Yes, and we mentioned this on the podcast before. The debt service, right? The repayment of public debt. And it's, by the way, it's really almost all of it now is accumulated interest. It's not the original money that we borrowed, but the interest that we're paying back. This is the biggest burden of our on our budget. I know it's ob- state obligations, of course, because the state borrowed this money. But this is because of, really, in my opinion, bad policies. The banks have been benefiting from this high interest rate uh, borrowing for so long. It's only fair that today they sacrifice some of this debt service, which is really making the, the like threatening to basically to cause a collapse in, the, in our national economy and accept this deal, which is really something very moderate compared to what the state can potentially do and a lot of what a lot of people have been suggesting. So I think this debt service aspect being tackled is the least we can do now and maybe the only valid thing we can do apart from maybe more progressive tax reform. But we can never expect that, especially in the current economy, in the, in the state of economy. And just to put the point on that, I just like to remind our listeners of, a, of something that we, a point that we made earlier this episode, the two largest banks each made half a billion dollars last year in profit. Mm. So... You know, yeah. So they made all of this money that they probably don't deserve. So they can at least take <laughs> one for the team. Yeah, I mean, look at the numbers. That that's my suggestion. Look at the numbers. Always look at the numbers. Um, and I think that's that's it for us. Obviously, this is sort of like a a, a very quick smash look at what we are looking at. But uh, hopefully, it elucidated for you guys what's going on with the budget and what to expect because. Obviously, there are more shoes to drop here. And very important to remember, this is not a final document. Uh, First of all, it's not official. Second, it has not been discussed publicly at all uh, yet. Cabinet's discussing it next week, starting on Tuesday. Exactly. And then it will go to Parliament because the budget is a law, right? And the Parliament has to to deliberate and like vote on it. So this is still a process. We might see a lot of changes. This was just a quick first look and looking at the essence of it. All right, and that's it for us. We'll be back next week. Until then, I'm Benjamin Red. I'm Nizar Hassan. And this has been the Lebanese Politics Podcast. Lebanese Politics Podcast is brought to you by myself, Nizar Hassan, Benjamin Red, produced behind the scenes by Susan Wilson, and the music is by Omar Elfil.